the world looks to California to answer the hard questions for redemption, to introduce the unfamiliar, to be resilient. Because California bounces back, holds us accountable, values who we are, remains vigilant, defies those in our way, and stands for community. Here on the West Coast, we're at the center of it all. Los Angeles Times, the state of what's next.
Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Envelope Live screening series. I'm Michael Ordonia. I cover film and television for the Los Angeles Times, especially for the Envelope. And we're gearing up for next week's Oscar nomination announcements, so keep an eye out for that. Today's film, of course, is Kevin McDonald's The Mauritanian. It's the story of longtime Guantanamo Bay detainee and now best-selling author, Mohamedou Ould Slahi. Slahi, as you know by now, was suspected by U.S. intelligence of helping hatch the Millennium Plot, which was intended for L.A., and of being one of the key recruiters of 9-11. However, despite detaining him for 14 years and subjecting him to torture, they never charged him with a crime. The Mauritanian is unusual for the genre of court dramas in that it's not absolutely concerned with Slahi's guilt or innocence. It turns on the issue of habeas corpus. As described in the film, that's the essential right of all people to have their day in court, to not be held indefinitely without charge. It's one of the building blocks of democracy that the powerful can't just jail people forever with no proof of a crime. Though there are political elements in the film, that's not one of them. The concept of habeas corpus is completely nonpartisan. So the film is about two things, that right and the survival and perseverance of the human spirit. I don't know how you'd react to being jailed for 14 years without charge, but I'd probably react pretty badly. So from all accounts, Slahi did not. He emerged from the ordeal with a sense of peace I think most of us would consider enviable. Here to talk about these aspects of the film, we have with us today the star of The Mauritanian, a remarkable French actor I consider one of the most interesting performers working today, Mr. Tahar Rahim. Mm -hmm. Tahar. Hey. Welcome. How are you, Michael? <laughs> all right, all right. It's good to see you again. Yeah, me too, really. Thank you for having me here tonight. Oh, it's a pleasure, sir. Uh, uh, we. We spoke before, of course, uh, for a piece that's now available in the envelope about the film. It was uh, uh, great to talk to you then. And I, I have to warn you, I'm going to ask you some of the same questions for, for the viewers, but hopefully we'll delve a little deeper than we did before as well. All good. Great. Uh, so I wanted to start with that very notion of guilt and innocence. Um, as I was saying in the intro, the film doesn't really concern itself with whether he did it or not. It's more about habeas corpus. But as an actor, of course, you have to decide for yourself. Um, and in our conversation before, you told me that you had a very strong feeling about it, whether he did it or not. Could you share that with us, how you came to that decision and, and what influenced you? Of course, I thought about it when I, uh, when I first read the script. And uh, as I was reluctant to play uh, uh, you know, terrorists or uh, stereotypical characters, uh, I thought about it, but you know, when you when you think about it deeply and you meet the man, when you meet the man, it's obvious he is innocent. And plus, we're talking about the law. I mean, he won his case. There's no no charges against him. And uh, Nancy Hollander someday said, uh, if there was any proof, uh, somebody would have come up with after 20 years. And uh, when you're thinking more deeply, I don't think a guilty man could be able to handle 72 days of torture. And, you know, you got to talk to Mohammed to understand that the guy is innocent. We, he couldn't harm even a fly, you know. Uh, you said something before. That I don't know if our, our viewers are aware, but you of course, we're in the, uh, the miniseries of Looming Tower. Um, and when you're working on that, you met some intelligence professionals, right? Yeah. That was, yeah, uh, I mean, that was a, yeah, go ahead. No, sir. you. <laughs> uh, that was about the lead up to 9-11. And uh, when we spoke before, you said something interesting about uh, talking with some of them about Slahi. Well, uh, can you tell us anything about those conversations when you spoke with some of the intelligence professionals you've met? You know, uh, I'm not going to mention names or whatever, you know, but, uh, yeah, uh, I remember when uh, I read the script and uh, I was really interested in, in doing the movie, and I signed in, like, you know, right after I read it, uh, straight away. And I called a friend of mine who's, uh, uh, who was in the FBI, and he said, listen, there's some things about him, but uh, 
no, people like him. <laughs> and I, I read a book, you know, uh, the road to 9-11 and what happened before. And I read a line saying, it was not in a book where someone said it to me, I forgot. Uh, there's a lot of smoke, but no fire at all. <laughs> Sometimes you you're just the wrong guy in the wrong place. And that's what happened to him, you know. Hmm. Well, uh you were just saying that it seemed obvious to you when you met him that he 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 couldn't hurt a fly. And you uh of course you weren't trying to do an impersonation of the guy, you weren't trying to take on his vocal manners or mannerisms or anything. I mean, most of us have never seen or heard him or had never before this. Uh so that wasn't really from meeting him. What did you take away that you, you really thought was essential to convey in your performance, that you had to get out there to the viewers? Oh, many things, you know. Uh, by talking with him and observe him, uh, I started, you know, to understand the way he moves, the way he looks at things, the way he talks. And there was something very important that I really want to catch is uh, the way he would answer questions because it's been interrogated 18 hours a day. And I knew that I would go through this uh, um, throughout the movie. And I was like, okay, this is very important because it's a big part of the movie. And uh, you can't just answer questions like this. And by looking at him, the way he moves his eyes and the way he answers questions, which means sometimes uh, there's uh, humor in it. Sometimes it's just very serious. And sometimes, sometimes it's like just, okay, I, I just don't want to talk today. And uh, that was very important and interesting to me. But I needed to catch his spirit, who he is. And it was something that was very hard for me to understand is uh, how can you be, you know, this man after being through this horrific ordeal, like I'm talking about forgiveness. So we were just the two of us talking on Skype. And I'm like, okay, now we're just the two of us. Just tell me you still maybe you still have a little bit of anger or resentment. And he was like, uh, and he told me, no, no, I was angry. The because I couldn't understand why it was me, why I was there. And uh everything changed when he decided to forgive people. And this is what I wanted to understand. And he said, When you forgive people who did bad things to you, uh it's a treat you give to yourself. So you free your mind. And you eventually might have the power to change people's mind. And he did. He succeeded. Because he befriended with some guards and, uh, they, you know, some of them that would torture him while he was being tortured. He would tell them, uh, why do you do this to yourself? So to reach that level of philosophy of wisdom, uh, I like to think that this guy is a a gifted soul. I don't know how I would react to this, to be honest. But it's a great philosophy to take for yourself, a great direction to take in life, and something that I want to convey to, my, to the people I love and my um, my kids too. You know, you uh, um, previously said when I when I asked you about. So uh, places where you two intersect. You said interesting about um, the way you, you're both devoted to your mothers. You, you love your, your mothers very much. And of course, that was a, um, a key element in the way they, uh, his captors tried to um, um, get information out of him, using his uh, harm to his mother as a threat. Um, and here I want to say I had to, I had to watch the movie again to prepare for this. And the movie really rewards repeat viewing. It's, uh, uh, I found that there were some textures in it, some things I'd missed the first time around. And those torture scenes, even though I knew where they were going, where it was going to end up, I found them very effective the second time around. Mm -hmm. So um, can you share with the viewers what it was like to shoot some of those scenes, what you had to put your body through to, and your mind to uh, uh, convey what he experienced? Yeah. Uh, so you watched it twice yeah. <laughs> and then you said, Oh, what a nice comedy, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So a laugh ride. It's a feel good comedy of the season. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, concerning the torture scenes, it was, I of course, I asked him. I had to. That's my job. And I, uh, how could I know what it is, what it feels like? Uh, fortunately, I have never been tortured before. And I hope it's never going to happen. Knock on wood. Um, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I asked him about it and suddenly he changed uh his face darkened uh his eyes would move strangely he was uh unarticulate and i felt bad i felt i was uh you know pacing beyond the line in a way and he would never have told me something like yes yeah, stop man you know it's not cool because he's, he's too nice and too polite so i was like man stop it now stop it now who do you think you are to bring him back there? He's been suffering for too long. And uh, I know we're making movies and it's important. It's my passion. And uh, obviously it's yours too, but there's some limits. You know, we're talking about real human being. And I stopped. I never asked him those questions ever. I thought I might fight. I will find a way to do it. So um, I thought about it and I was doing my research. I I was you know online and and uh, and I found a a very strange thing but but real it was a uh, um, a reality show which was set like in the in in a Guantanamo Bay style wow. you know the candidates there was candidates that would try uh, to be in the real conditions and guards. And, and uh, it felt like the guards were professionals. So you could tell how far they could handle that situation. And some of them would, you know, crack because uh, it was too violent. And you could tell the people who would be stronger. But when it came to, to humiliation, finished. Hmm. So it was very interesting, very inspiring for this part. And uh, when I was on set, I, I needed to, you know, to get as close as possible to the actual conditions of Mohamedou, out of respect to him, to 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 the people who's been in a situation, and who are still some of them, and mm -hmm. to convey uh, uh, as to be as authentic as possible for for the audience and my director. So uh, yeah, I asked them to 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 shackle me for real, to turn the cells as cold as possible. Uh, to waterboard me for real, but um, I we had our little signals in case uh, I, I, you know, I didn't want to hurt myself, um, uh, put myself in danger. And uh, Kevin got worried. He was like, "It's okay, man. We got it. I believe in what you're doing." And I felt like, you know, what? don't worry, I'm not gonna die. <laughs> I'll do it. I, I needed to go as far as possible, and um, uh, something happened. Acting wise, it was it was not about performing. It was more more of an experience, and uh, you find yourself touching a sort of truth, you know, from your fingertips, and and this is what you're looking for as an actor, and um, and I, I, I usually we play with our emotions and we control them. Uh, and this time it was the other way around. I felt like it would have been a mistake to control my emotions. So I, 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 I let them, uh, led me to some crazy places and, and, and I was so sensitive. And, and there was this moment, you, you know, this moment you talked about, uh, about the mom. Yes. I, I, I lost my mom and he, he lost his too. And uh, when uh, when when he is in, in the cell and starts to hallucinate because it didn't sleep and you know, uh, I almost saw mine, my own mom. It was it was strange. Uh, I just did one take. I, I I couldn't do more than that. And then I collapsed. It was too heavy. Yeah, that that sounds like a pretty dark place to go. Um, mm. I don't want to say the the wrong amount of weight you lost for this. I mean, you're not exactly a heavy guy to begin with, but you lost what, like 25 pounds for this, something like that. I can talk in kilos. <laughs> <Okay>. Ten kilos. <laughs> Ten kilos. 
10 kilos. Uh, the smarter people in the audience go, oh, yeah, 10 kilos is as many pounds. I, I, I'm going, should I get my phone out? Um, <laughs> well, now that the, the film is out there and, and people are responding to it and, you know, like getting award nominations, as you know, um, have there been responses to the film that have, uh, um, I don't know, been illuminating to you or, or really stayed with you? Or really what? Sorry. Stayed with you. I mean, has anyone responded mm. to the film in a way, uh, you know, even just people on the street or oh, yeah. people who've gotten a hold of you that, that really made a difference to you? Uh, look, man, I got to read you a text that I had from someone that I don't know, right? Oh, please. Wait a second. I'm, I'm just going to pick my phone. It's all right. In, in the meantime, we'll play some uh, uh, we'll play some filler music. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, you know, in, on Instagram, you got those DMs, and uh, uh, and each time I, I get interviewed, and and uh, they ask me, "What do you want uh, the audience to take from the movie?" And and, and I always say, uh, "If people with preconceived ideas can just uh, you know start to question themselves, and eventually." change their mind, it would be a, a beautiful and important step forward. And I have this message. Mm -hmm. And where is it? One second, I'm sorry. I'll be quick, but uh, I'll find it. Almost there. Okay. Yeah. So uh, he's saying good things about the movie and, and all, but... It's like, uh, I was one of the people who hated anyone in connection with 9-11. I even ended a friendship because of me being stubborn. Your, oh. your role actually had me in tears through your character's horrific ordeal. I actually contacted my old friend and begged him to expect my apology. You helped me uh, turn my feelings 360 degrees. And then... He said, sad part is I am a minor. You see, it's, it's incredible, the power of movies sometimes, but above all, power of forgiveness. Sad part is I am a minority from Cuba and seeing beautiful beach from my homeland and your character blocked from seeing broke my heart. I hope the real person you played accepts my apologies for my hate at the time we all learn, at the time we all learn with knowledge uh, and so and so. Isn't it beautiful? Best reward yeah. ever. That, ha, that's great, man. That must be really gratifying for you to receive a a, a response like that to you know, oh. to this film. It feels so good. You know, you're like, okay, that's... because uh, you know, movies. We make movies because we love it. We want to have fun. We're we're uh, uh, big kids in a way. It's like a big playground for us, but it's serious at the same time. We we'll like to make comedies, and and but sometimes movies are so meaningful that they're even beyond cinema. And this one is uh, is beyond um, cinema in itself, you know, because it carries a, a such humanity and the message of the, uh, you know, it's about universal values. It's is more important than what we do. When I read this message. I'm like, okay, I did something meaningful in my life. I'm really happy about it. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't suppose um, Sly's had a chance to see the movie, has he? Or do you know if he's seen it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he watched it. And, uh, man, I knew it. I was home. I was so, uh, uh, you know, so scared and, and nervous. Because he, obviously he was the, the first audience member I wanted to please. I didn't want him to feel diminished or uh, uh, betrayed in a way. And he was very happy. When he called me, he was uh, happier than I was when I saw it. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, yeah, he said, but still he was thinking of uh, people who are still living this and going through uh, this nightmare. He said, if the, the, it's good that this movie is about my story, but it's not my movie. It's the movie of all the people who's been through this. And I hope that uh, that it will help, you know, to close Guantanamo or stop people to doing those hor horrible things. So I was thinking of others one more time. Hmm. Hmm. 
All right, uh, Tahari, you know, you've answered all my questions for, for today. Uh, um, congratulations, really, on the film and on uh, the response the film's getting, especially the one that, that you brought up. Um, and do tell okay. Jodie Foster next time you see her that uh, I'm going to grill her about the Packers when I get a chance. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will. You can count on me. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> hey, thank you again for this <laughs> moment. And it was great. Always great talking to you. <laughs> great talking to you, Tar. And everyone, thank you for tuning in to um, the Envelope Screenings. And um, I hope you enjoyed the film and the interview. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye, everyone.